Welcome to the Curve Thought Podcast. I'm your host, Sean Rathlamfo. Okay, so for today's episode, we're going to be doing something that a little bit different from my usual track of things. We're going to be engaging in politics. The one area of inquiry I'm sure every South African is at this point tired of having to deal with, but aware of the reality that sometimes you don't necessarily have a choice but to engage in the subject matter. You know, the world doesn't give us the space to check out sometimes. Sometimes you just have to know what's going on because if you don't, then decisions will be made in your stead that will affect your life. And, you know, the question you have to always ask yourself is, is it better to better to have peace of mind right now in terms of not having to worry about what's happening in the grand scheme of things? Or is it better to actually have, to actually have peace of mind and security um, in your state of affairs in the long run? You know, often the two are mutually exclusive. It's either you're happy now or you feel happy and, and secure right now, but then your future is fucked or the opposite direction. Either way, where we are right now is not, we aren't able to avoid politics, especially given the week that it is. Um, it can't be lost on anybody that this is the weekend of the ANC elective conference. Uh, no matter what, the awful reign of the 54th National ele- ele- Elective Conference. Is it elective or electoral? I don't know, the NEC, the 54th one of the ANC, is going out this weekend, and they have to elect new leaders, which also means a new party president. Jacob Zuma does not seem like he will be running uh, for a third term, which means that the field is open. Well, I say the field is open in a tongue-in-cheek fashion, because um, we all know the only real contenders are Nkosa Sana, Dlamini Zuma, as well as Cyril Ramaphosa. But before we get there, before we get there, I just want to express from the out- onset that the purpose of making this video is to try and express my thoughts about what I think will happen this weekend in the 16th. This is effectively a truth-telling or a fortune-telling exercise on my part. Um, I will be going away for the weekend to a family camp. So by the time I return, the results will already be in and we will know what the new ANC will look like. Well, if the conference proceeds as planned, but I'll get to that in a moment. Anyway, by that point, it'll be too late for me to say, hey, I thought this might happen. This might not happen. You know, this is part and parcel of reasoning in public, right? You have to take the risk of making a call and sometimes being judged wrong. But the point I wanted to make, actually, is that from the onset, I do not want to get into the merits of what I believe should happen come 2019 necessarily, you know? Right now, the purpose of this particular episode is to Just examine what's happening within the ANC and what likely outcomes you might expect given what's happening within the ANC itself. Regardless of whether or not I believe the ANC as a whole is the party we want um, going forward as a ruling agency. But that's a separate episode, separate conversation. So without any further ado, let's get into it. Um, The first thing I want to explore actually is... I'm not, I don't know if how many of you know Gayton McKenzie, author of books such as The Hustler's Bible, Uncomfortable Truth, as well as, what is the other one he wrote? Selling something to something? I don't know. But anyway, Gayton McKenzie is an ex-criminal, um, came out of jail, became a motivational speaker, which is fine. You know, you paid your debt to society, didn't get out of jail early, you know, did his full term, that's okay. Became a motivational speaker, they after did, started doing some business. Um, heavily involved with Kenny Kunene, who's another mogul in our scene, in the SA scene, but whatever. He's not the topic of today's discussion. Anyway, Gaden McKenzie, after that, suddenly now he is uh, beyond simply writing books on motivation, um, personal responsibility, and, you know, those kind of, that genre of reading. He is now suddenly delved into politics. Um, the first time that we saw him mentioned in a political light was when he appeared with Kenny Kunene, in Russia, him, Kenukunene, and David Maslobo were spotted talking to some Rosatan agents in Russia. Make of that what you will. Uh, David Maslobo is our energy minister. Rosatan is the Russian nuclear agency that has been lobbying to build our nuclear plants in the, thank God, delayed forever nuclear deal. Um, but that's suddenly he appeared as a political player in that capacity. And now he's come up with a new book called kill zuma by any means necessary 
And what I find really interesting and very striking about this book is the subtitle, right? So the book is Kill Zuma by Any Means Necessary. And the subtitle is A Book Unleashing White Monopoly Capital's Plans to Kill Zuma. Which is interesting, right? Because for the past, say, two, three years, right? Whenever any criticism comes towards, specifically towards Zuma and the Zuma faction within the ruling party of the ANC, this is always the trump card that gets pulled out, white monopoly capital. Um, our wonderful friends in Britain, Bell Pottinger, helped popularize the term, even though they were not the ones to invent it. But they helped popularize it in our lexicon of discourse. Them and the Guptas spread a lot of information about it. And effectively, it refers to the system whereby white people are still, by and large, um, in control of the economy and in control of the money in the country. Uh, and it's usually deployed... Now, okay, like, let's first get one thing clear. That is an absolute fact of the matter, that by and large, it is still mostly white people who... like White, white people are more, have more money, more possessions, more economic strength, more JSC buying power, JSC holding power, and just in general, by any metric by which you measure economic health, progress, and strength, white people are better off than black people. That is absolutely true. Uh, what is interesting, though, is that this is always brought up as a like, way to detract from attention, like negative attention lobbied towards Zuma and his friends. So the moment that you start crying about corruption and saying, yo, what the fuck, you guys are mismanaging funds, misappropriating funds, entire municipalities are going with money, millions of rands just suddenly off the books, then they say, oh, what about white monopoly capital, you know? So kind of a a beautiful whataboutism that they make use of. It's not new though. The ANC has been doing this, or specific people within the ANC have been doing this for quite a long time, where any criticism levied towards any black person is met with, but what about that bad white guy, you know? As if, as if that legitimizes what's going wrong. Uh, two wrongs never, never ever make a right, but especially not in a ham-fisted way, especially when the two wrongs aren't even related. It's one thing to say like, let's say, you decide to assault me and then I decide to come and assault you back. Or no, no, let's not even go that extreme. Let's say you steal my yogurt in the fridge one day and then the next day I steal your Coke. You know, it's not right for me to steal my Coke, but in the grand scheme of things, we can all understand why it's sort of equitable that such a thing would happen, even though, even if we don't think that it's the right thing to do, because these are related topics. Whereas one person doing corruption is completely unrelated from somebody else's corruption. Um, a point which the ANC is at great pains to never admit, but a point which is nonetheless true. But anyway, the reason it's interesting here is Gaten McKenzie has not never before this point really been on somebody who's injected himself in the conversation by using white monopoly capital um, as a rallying cry. Because for very good reason, it has become the rallying cry of a particular faction within the ruling party. If somebody starts mentioning white monopoly capital or right, radical economic transformation, you by and large know that they're either Zuma loyalists or Zuma allies. Either way, um, they've staked exactly where they stand in the line in the sand right now. So anyway, this particular book, he speaks about various attempts to assassinate the president. Um, for, I'll read you just the beginning of what Gayton McKenzie says this book is about. Uh, quote, he says, from the poisoning attempts involve, involving Mantuli, who is Zuma's ex-wife. Wait, I'm, I'm not sure if they're still married, but one of Zuma's wives. Um, but from the poisoning attempts involving Mantuli to another attempt at Lutuli House during a meeting of the ANC's top six, there was a near fatal tampering of the presidential jet. One of the president's most trusted bodyguards was operating on strict instructions to murder the old man. It's all in the book with the reasons why destroying Zuma has been so important to his enemies. I hope that if people can understand why Zuma is hated so much, they will actually understand what's really at play in this country and why the stakes are so high and have always been so high. If this book achieves that, I'll be the happiest man. Um, the book claims to take people back into the 1980s when Zuma came to know about the white monopoly capital paid ANC members and their involvement in bringing his nation down during the apartheid era. He is said to have spent four months flying around and meeting people with to prepare for his investigation for the same. So... <laughs> so basically this is going to read sort of like some Jason Bourne type fiction right uh, and it is so two things that, that are very operative here if we read underneath the 
the glossiness of what this is going to sound like, right? Go underneath the spin. Firstly, the accusation of anybody trying to murder a sitting president is an extremely serious accusation. It is not tantamount to treason. It is literally treason to do such a thing. So he is asserting in this book that there has been several treasonous attempts against the president's life, which if they were firstly legitimate, if, they, if, they, if such things happen, right? If you're a sitting president and somebody tries to kill you, what possible reason do you have to keep this a secret? You know, because if you think about it, telling people that you've successfully averted an assassination attempt makes it less likely for future assassination attempts, given that people know, oh, this man is on watch, he is hard to kill, going to try and kill him tends to fail, so let's stop trying. Whereas if you say nothing, people can still keep trying. And the fact that we have, as of yet, no public proclamations of anybody being put either in jail or through the legal process for treason, you know, because it is also illegal to protect somebody who you suspect is guilty of treason. So if you find somebody and they tell you, listen, I tried to kill the president and you don't report them, or you don't try them, you don't put them through the legal system. If that if those things don't happen, you are committing a crime yourself. So it's extremely unlikely, firstly, that this that these many assassination attempts happened without any of us knowing anything about it. Um, no investigations, no journalists, no judges, no advocates, nothing really. But somehow Gaten McKenzie gets to the truth. Um, anyway, that's a separate rant. The real what I was trying to say about this is looking underneath the spin. Pretty clear that this is all about trying to set up Zuma as per usual, what Zuma is good at doing. Set him up as the victim, right? Set him up as this tragic figure whom the world has unilaterally decided to set itself against, right? Set Zuma up as the champion of the poor, the champion of real South Africans, um, which is why he ex very expressly puts the line, I hope people can understand why Zuma is hated so much, right? And what's really at play in this country and why the stakes are so high. Trying to set Zuma up as the man who took power and who's maintained power, not for his own sake, but for the sake of the people. And the reason he is still staying there and fighting so hard to stay there is not for his own sake, but because he's trying to protect the people. The stakes are high for the country, not just for himself. Therefore, this book is trying to paint Zuma in that light as the tragic, heroic figure who needs protection, right? And who's being unfairly vilified and a witch hunt is basically being uh, put up against him. I mean, the, sub the subtitle of the book gives you that information clear, you know, kills him by any means necessary. Like, can you think of pe there's, can you think of anybody whom people will go out of their way to say, we have to kill this man by any means necessary? Like, you have to be some other type of, like, the, the things you have to be trying to do in life for that kind of statement to be mentioned, that somebody says your life at any, by, there is no price high enough which we will not pay if it means getting rid of you. Seems, okay, cool. Um, usually those aren't bad guys that people say we have to kill by any means necessary. But whatever. Um, the second thing that this book is trying to achieve, it is once again trying to paint Zuma as a ally of the common black man up against white monopoly capital. And against white monopoly capital paid ANC members, as he mentions in this particular description of the book which, as we know, generally tends to mean people who disagree with the president. If you disagree with the president, you are a white monopoly capital paid ANC member. And therefore, you not only are you not deserving of protection, or respect or any due diligence, you are categorically the enemy and you are trying to kill Zuma. You know, you're trying to kill this man who's going to champion the working class as it, or the common dude on the streets. Um, and another thing that this book is trying to achieve is it's obviously trying to change minds. Um, I didn't read for you the whole thing, exactly what Gate McKenzie said. I will put this in the show notes. But one of the things that he does say, um, he says that, where is that particular line? Uh, all right, here we go. 
Uh, the main thing I'm hoping to do is turn people's assumptions on their head because so much of what, what we think about South Africa is simply wrong. That's a big task and maybe this book can play a small part in changing people's thinking and understanding of our history. So, changing minds, right? He mentions how much you have to read this. Also, I have to really mention that this is some shuckster type shit. How there's basically no factual information in anything he said. Um, he's expressing that the only thing you have to do, that you have to read the book. Like, oh my God read this book man like i can't tell you what it's about really i can't tell you like where i got the information but yeah really really read this book um you know trying to move units is what he wants you to think he wants you to think it's about trying to move units but it's not like he says here it's trying to change people's minds and trying to change people's mind the timing is extremely important right we are this book is supposedly supposed to come out he made this announcement on monday about this book yesterday uh, it is going to be releasing, as he asserts, in digital copies this week. Um, and he does say in this particular long-form interview that he wants to try and change people's minds about the elective conference. And he wants to release this information ahead of time so nobody can say, Comrade, why did you have this information and not let us know? Uh, as it stands, that does, you know, does reveal his hand, that this is... If you, because he says also mentions that he's only going to be releasing the book in hardcover formats or in physical format at the end of the year, whereas the digital edition would release this week. And one of the things about digital releases, especially in South Africa of essay books, as we saw with the Jack Bauer book, how the PDF document that went around the country way faster than the book, even though the book still moved massive numbers, people always had access to the PDF almost immediately and could read it from there. So Mackenzie wants to do the same thing get the digital edition out first, um, revealing, I think, crucially, that this is not at all about money. This is not at all about, he's not really concerned about you actually paying him for this book, right? What's more important is that the, your mind about Jacob Zuma has changed. And what's even more important is that your mind about Jacob Zuma has changed before the elective conference. And it's even more important that your mind about Jacob Zuma has changed before the elective conference if you are an ANC delegate heading to the elective conference. So trying to sway votes. Um, I think having seen the way the wind has been turning lately, it might be necessary for the Zuma camp to do something like this. But anyway, I think this is... <laughs> this book is... Um, the reason why I actually want to discover why I began by discussing this book is because I think this book is firstly textbook Zuma in the sense that before any major decision needs to be made that will that might negatively impact the president we always see that new information emerges that paints him as a tragic figure we saw this i think it was the was it the ethics committee um the anc ethics committee beforehand before i think it was june was it june or may um when they met and they were asking yo jay-z why not why not step down and the nec the last nec meeting that happened and they were speaking to zuma saying dude just step down just get out of here and before that particular meeting happened there was a lot of buzz in the air zuma talking about you know these foreign ministries and foreign agents and then at the meeting itself discussing how any attempt to overthrow him or get him to step down is effectively a ploy by imperialists, American and European imperialists, to remove him from power for probably the reasons that will be stated in this book. But what this does is it sure tells us one thing. It tells us that right now the president does not feel confident about what's going to happen this weekend because a confident Zuma is a quiet Zuma. If Zuma and his allies are saying nothing, you know that the president feels he's in control. The moment that you see Nom Vulamo Konyane, Batavile Tlamini, David Mathobo, now Gaten McKenzie, as well as one other person. Um, as well as, I think, wasn't Arthur Fraser, it was, it was, it was, I think it was Ace Mahashule, the Free State Premier. When all these people start talking about the fact that any political will levied against Zuma is in fact the political will of imperialists and of Western agents and of white monopoly capital, then you start to get suspicious about what's going on. You're like, oh, okay, Zuma is not feeling hot right now. Um, but moving forward to the actual weekend, all right, a couple of things, you know, for the long, it was really interesting as well, taking note of the spin around the particular conference. 
because early on in the year, um, it was pretty clear that it was going to be a situation where Cyril Ramaphosa going 1v1 versus Nkwasa Sanatla Minizuma. And when that became apparent, it became also apparent that the last thing the Zuma camp wanted or was to actually make this a clear, open contest, right? A pure 1v1 fight, fair fight, is not something that's in Zuma's best interests in this regard. So what they set out to do, which was actually brilliant from their part, um, was setting up both Jackson Tembu as well as Matthews Poza as potential, quote-unquote, unity candidates, you know? Uh, people who can come in the middle and sort of reach a compromise between the positions of Nkwasazana and the positions of Cyril and say, all right, I'll be the new leader. You guys can be my deputies. Uh, also part of Zuma, Zuma at, I think in, in June at that NEC meeting, he did mention that he wants to have, he wants the country to have two deputy presidents, which is not, a, I don't think a terrible idea, but it was also pretty clear that at the time he was thinking for the long game, right? Understanding that if he can't have his preferred candidate as leader, rather have his preferred candidate as deputy leader, still in a sphere of influence and not completely ousted from the party because the man is going to need political protection. Something we'll discuss a little bit later. But anyway, from there, um, from that time ago, when it became clear that a 1v1 contest is not in their favor, we began to hear more and more people who would traditionally would expect to side fully within Kwasazana started saying things like, well, let us, let us explore more options. Let's have a third way candidate, you know. Um, and they tried to paint, painting the Cyril camp, often very successfully, I must admit, as those of the power for its own sake, they just want to be the ones in charge. They don't necessarily care about the ANC as a movement, as a party. It's more about them being in charge rather than the entire party being better off under their leadership. And for a while, actually, that was a very successful gambit. Um, but then it became clear that they didn't really mean it. It was basically just all rhetoric because no additional money was being funneled or no more spe no speaking engagements were being funneled towards those additional candidates who were supposedly questing for unity. And it was still primarily about um, NDZ and CR17, you know, Jackson Tembo and Zulim Kiza sitting around just being like, what the hell, guys? Zulim Kize, not Jackson Tim. Jackson Tim was still just the treasurer general. He's not running for president of the ANC. That's Zulim Kize. Um, and Matthews Poza. Both of them were supposed to be the unity candidates, as it were. But as we saw, the people who were advocating for them to be unity candidates weren't willing to give them the time of day to get that unity going. So, yeah, still made it pretty clear where their loyalty stood at the time. Um, so now... Zuma does this. Cyril spends the majority of the year effectively lobbying the urban blacks or just the urban areas, right? We saw like he didn't really put much emphasis on getting too deep into the rural areas and except with the exception of Limpopo and some areas of KZN, which it could really be argued were strategic moves on his part, more so than actual groundswell, more so than like a ground-based effort. It was more about ensuring that he'd have some delegates. Um, Limpopo, his home province, guaranteeing that he'd win there, uh, whereas KwaZulu just trying to steal votes away from Nkwasazana, probably expect with the expectation that Mpumalanga, if Mpumalanga under the control tightly of Esma Khashule, no matter what, they were always going to vote for NDZ by and large. So CR17 focuses his efforts on claiming the urban vote, getting the home vote and just debilitating some of the support structures for NDZ, uh, making it hard for her to just amass support purely on, on the premises of her groundwork. Uh, so just trying to frustrate her in those ways. And it mo seemed largely successful. Like, it wasn't in retrospect, right? As I'm looking at this in retrospect, it seems clear that CR17 wasn't necessarily playing the cleanest game. Uh, in terms of most of his allies at the branch and national and provincial level, seem to have found a real taste this year for going to court. We saw a lot of court challenges for basically everything, right? If anybody lost, immediately to court. And this actually didn't start Zuma. This didn't start from the Zuma camp. Zuma's camp is primarily skilled at using litigation to delay prosecution, but. 
CR17 realized that you can use litigation to overturn results, which became interesting because 2017 became largely the year where we felt like we were being governed by the court system, um, courts forcing people to do stuff. And I think that has a lot to do... Where was the first place to do this? I think it was the Eastern Cape. No, no, that was later. That was like July. I think earlier in the year, um, somewhere... I forget if it was the Free State or somewhere in KwaZulu, but there was a court challenge by one of CR17's supporters, one of his allies, and it's basically gone all downhill since. Just everybody's been in court. Nobody knows who's in charge of the branches. You know, the branches send delegates to the elective conference, and they're the ones that have to vote. So, yeah, that just changed everything in those terms. But it seems to have worked for him um, by the recent counts. Looks like Cyril Ramaphosa has a higher delegate count, but we'll never know up until the point the actual vote happens. Right. And having set the stage for what the vote is going to look like between Ngosazana and Cyril, there's a couple of important things to take note of um, and why this particular election matters more so than previous ones and why I'm wasting me as a non-ANC member still believes that it's worthwhile to talk about and that we have to talk about it. Usually the winner of an a any particular ANC contest goes on to become the president of the entire country. But the circumstances around this is kind of different. So firstly, there is a difficulty incurred by Nkosazana by the fact that she will, regardless of her own individual faults or merits, always be perceived as a continuation of the Zuma legacy, which is primarily been characterized by a lack of oversight, impunity, um, casual disregard for the rule of law, corruption, state capture, all the negative things that we all... The, basically, the reasons why the bookshelves of our bookstores aligned with books negative about Zuma and why this kills Zuma at any means necessary is probably the first book. I think it's actually the first book to come out in South Africa that's going to speak positively about the president of the republic. Every other book, if you were to go look for any other book that mentions Jacob Zuma, it's going to be negative almost by default. So, knowing this, this puts the Nkosazana camp in a very precarious position because a majority of her allies right now are also Jacob Zuma's allies. So, a victory for her will, whether correctly or not, we don't know exactly what her own aspirations are well, with regards to policy at the very least because radical economic transformation is a buzzword that doesn't mean shit. So, we don't know exactly how she's going to want to govern but we know how the people who she's allied herself with would prefer things are governed. And that's the way things are being governed now, which is just, here's the keys to the kingdom, everybody. Go nuts. Don't worry about the cops. Don't worry about the judges. Don't worry about prosecution. Don't worry about special operatives. Just do what you need to do and we'll be Gucci. And under those circumstances, this puts, the reason this puts her in a difficult position is should she emerge on top? Right? Should she emerge having won this particular contest? It might be an overall loss for the ANC because there's a lot of space between now and 20, 2019 when the next elections are. A lot of damage can still be done by the ruling part or the ruling, the current sitting government as it stands right now can really still fuck things up a lot. Um, I mean, what, two recessions in a year? They can make three happen easily. So under those circumstances, the ANC has to know that a win for her might not necessarily translate into a win for the ruling party because people will say to themselves, well, the last eight, the last 10 years in 2019 were absolute dog shit. So why would we want to empower people who seem set to either repeat or double down on the last 10 years? Also complicated by the fact that whether she likes it or not, there is a huge swath of the population that wants to see wrongdoing and corrupt politicians in jail and i a lot of her allies are those people who people want to see in jail for their wrongdoing and corruption making it unlikely that she's actually going to follow through on doing that because you don't want to get into power and then turn around and jail everybody who put you there right that's not how you want to be running things and of course the implicit understanding from her own coalition right now is that Supporting her is effectively a get out of jail free card. You do these things, you keep up with the pace as it stands right now, and you get to continue on 
with reckless impunity without any threats of external pressure so because of that the status quo doesn't change if she becomes elected um, or at least it seems very unlikely to change you know, i'm not a mind reader she might have plans on her mind to just suddenly do an about face uh, and become this maverick leader which we need but well, seems very doubtful given who she's chosen to ally herself with so voting for her means status quo stays the same and if the status quo stays the same we saw what happened in 2016 when the ANC lost basically every important metro um, having already lost the Western Cape metros years prior there's what of the eight metros in SA I think they only control three right now which is a huge problem for the ANC and it's not the big ones either um, and it doesn't seem like if it seems like if she gets elected and nothing she doesn't do anything to change the ANC as it stands because she keeps talking about changing the country and changing the way things are run outside of the scope of the ANC but right now people are looking towards the internal dynamics of the ANC and adjudicating whether or not those dynamics will result in good results for the country if they retain power in 2019 the answer seems likely to be no so her winning very bad for the ruling party pretty likely that if she wins the ANC loses power or will be forced to govern in a coalition fashion in 2019 which it's also unlike any any other party that wins enough of a vote that they can form a coalition with the ruling party will probably also be pressured to try and jail people which again if NDZ wins, not in her favor because the people that people will be calling to be jailed will be her allies, loyalists, and psychopaths. That's the last thing that she wants in that capacity. So a win for NDZ could very well spell a overall loss for the ANC in 2019, which must figure into the calculus for people voting right now. People, by and large, are able to read the mood of the country. People know what's happening. Um, people might pretend they don't hear things, and yell to the top of their lungs about uh, white monopoly capital and about foreign agents and uh, fake news and DA propaganda and 702 blacks, all that shit. But at the end of the day, the mere fact that you're able to recognize that there's this huge sort of people that are baying for your head means that you know that people aren't necessarily on your side by default, which puts them in a very difficult position. Uh, that being said, I think it's... Wait, okay, I'll get to that later, actually, who I think will win. So that's the calculus I think that'll go into what'll be happening if people are considered the pros and cons of voting for Nkosazan, you know? If you are a loyalist for Zuma and you want the status quo to continue, voting for her right now is extremely good for you because it delays any possible prosecutions, it delays, excuse me, any, it delays any possible blowback for your actions in the short term up until 2019 whether those actions be corrupt or not anything that you do is going to be swept under the rug but then after 2019 the game is up and it's over no more singing for your supper no more access to free money from metros or councillor positions uh, no more easy tender grabs because you know you'll be out of power you can't do you can't do that shit if you don't have power and that has to really factor into how people are going to vote so i think if you vote for Nkosazana right now the people that do vote for her will be thinking on the, along the lines of, okay, I'm going to vote for her now, but then the spree has to start. If Nkosa Zana Dlamini Zuma wins, I expect to see rampant corruption. And think about the fact that I'm saying rampant corruption in the context of living in rampant corruption. It'll multiply several fold, um, given that people will have an understanding that this is no longer a sure thing it's not a long-term proposition anymore there is a possibility of this ending which ironically if they do that which i think they will will probably hasten their end because people will be like oh you guys really don't give a fuck oh okay now we know for sure and we know not to vote for you now moving on to Cyril Ramaphosa voting for him is gonna also be difficult in terms of people within the ANC right now because you know that the man has made wide sweeping promises about renewing the, the ANC, um, refreshing the ANC, self-correcting the ANC, all these things, right? Which in the history of political discourse tends to translate into fire a ton of people, change a ton of departments, 
put some people in jail, uh, change up the whole system, right? And that is not, by and large, good for people within the ANC right now. The ANC has many, or let me say, many people in the ANC have grown significantly wealthy in recent years, in recent times, uh, on the backs of being able, by and large, to take advantage of the clout and impunity being in the ruling party gives you to either make money, get cash off of tenderpreneur deals, the wide influence that you wield, you know, and also not having to really be a public servant, more like a overpaid government spokesperson. You know, a lot of these people end up living in such ways. But if Cyril is to win, then that means that that shit is probably going to stop because it seems likely that a win for Cyril Ramaphosa is going to mean a win for the quote-unquote rule of law, which you know means a bunch of people are going to be sent to jail whom before were considered untouchable. And we can discuss the individual ethics of ANC members, but one thing that we can't dispute about human psychology is that when people know they're untouchable, when people know that there's no possible way that their bad behavior will be, will be met with negative consequences, that tends to encourage and incentivize people to behave badly, you know, to behave in ways that we would judge as behaving poorly. But when you are in that space of feeling untouchable, it's very difficult to say to yourself, you know what, I'd rather, I'd rather be in danger. I'd rather be in a situation where if I fuck up, I can go to jail and nobody can help me. You know, I prefer that state of affairs. I mean, the best place to think about this and think about how this is definitely true. If we remember uh, Vusipikoli, the old National Director of Public Prosecutions, the office now occupied by Sean the Sheep Abrams. What a joke. Anyway, when he was initially fired by Tabombeki for investigations into Jackie Selebi, it was, you know, it was, it was evident then and definitely evident in follow-up investigations that Jackie Selebi was guilty as shit. He was guilty as, he was like, what the fuck, bro? Like, we know you're a bad actor. Tabombeki had to have known that this man was a bad actor, but the culture of impunity of being above the law of being, you know, we're an ANC, we're ANC members. What the hell, guys? You can't be prosecuting us. That culture predates Jacob Zuma. That culture predates the state capture apparatus as it exists right now. That culture began with the Mbeki era and has, has flourished under Zuma, but it began all the way back then. Even somebody who now, in retrospect, we all consider to be a fount of wisdom and somebody who was unfairly judged for his shortcomings at the time, um, even he, Tabombeki, was unable to actually elevate himself beyond the place of wanting to have complete immunity from the law for he and his friends. So it's unlikely that that culture changes overnight mentally, right? Even though that's what Sir Ramaphosa expresses to want to change. So if you're an ANC delegate and you're going to vote right now, you will be voting up against your own intuition in that regard because now you'll know you're putting yourself and possibly other people whom you could benefit from in possible material danger of, you know, prison, prosecution, having their name dragged through the mud, etc., that kind of thing, without any expectation of protection from the ruling party, which is something that they need. Um, people like protection, so it will mean that. It will also mean... One of the things that the ANC has prided itself on um, is being sort of anti-establishment, you know. The ANC always prides itself on being able to come to their own formulation of the truth apart from what the apart from what the media is saying, apart from what business is saying, even sometimes apart from what the judiciary is saying. The ANC has always prided itself on being saying, you know what, guys, we determine our own path, we make our own decisions, we adjudicate for ourselves the direction this party must go. But voting for Cyril Ramaphosa would be tacitly admitting that that process of self-discovery has failed because the man has said more than once that he's going to be taking into account more seriously what people in general, people on the ground, people in media, people from other political parties are saying about the ANC and using that as part of the calculus to assess decisions the ANC must make. 
So if you're a delegate voting for CR17, that's also what you have to keep in mind, that you're, you're definitely going to be voting for a man who intends very specifically to limit the power of the ANC, right? You're, you might be voting on the one hand, you might be saying to yourself, look, the ANC has gotten to the point where it is so rotten, it is so beleaguered by corruption, by nepotism, by incompetence, incompetence, by lassitude, by all these things that there is basically no choice but to try and self-destruct and start afresh. But you'll be doing so with the understanding that the lofty heights that the ANC once had, if Sir Ramaphosa gets elected as ANC leader, he is going to expressly try to limit the ANC from getting to that position again by making power more open, sharing power with, not sharing power, but making the ANC more accountable and accountability just tends to lessen your overall power anyway. So that's the mindset that you, you have to take that into account as well if you're a voter for Serrano Maposa. And thirdly, and I think most importantly, if you are voting for Serrano Maposa, you are implicitly saying, at least to the people on the other side of the aisle, you're, you know that you'll be saying to them that we think that you guys are corrupt and this guy that you all accuse of being an agent of white monopoly capital, of being an agent of Western powers, of being a DA lackey, all these things, we are saying that we don't care and that there's no longer room for racialized politics in the ANC, which is a big deal. I think that's a really big deal. I don't think it can be understated the role of which racialized politics has had, um, firstly, in protecting the hege hegemonic power of the ANC, but secondly, in stifling debate within the ruling party about what should be done and about whose advice to take for the future. Once you remove a large part of that racial element, it makes it very, very difficult to say to somebody. So, for instance, let's say somebody starts accusing somebody in the ruling party of corruption five years from now after a Soro Ramaphosa win. And this is somebody that you deeply like, you're loyal to them, you agree with all their policies, you know, they're your, they're your boy, they're your person, they're your guy. It makes it impossible in those circumstances for you to pull the race card anymore. Because before you could just pull the race card and it was fine, criticism would stop. Um, you didn't have to engage substantively in what's going wrong. But now you can't do that anymore. Now you're going to have to openly deal with what these criticisms mean and whether or not they're valid, regardless of what you think about this person, um, or risk sounding just like an idiot. I mean, already you sound like an idiot if you're that kind of person who meets every criticism of Zuma with what about the white guy. But if Cyril's in charge, Green, you're going to sound especially idiotic to go that route, given that the man has gone to great pains, great, 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 great pains to set himself up as the non-racial president, you know? I don't think it's, he it doesn't mention very often, even when he discusses the land issue or the demographics of our, our, of our economy, he always speaks about it from a far away perspective, you know? Zuma, for example, Zuma will say something like, our people are struggling against white monopoly capital. And therefore, we need to dismantle these systems of oppression by white people. Whereas Ramaphosa would say something like, within our land, there's a segment of our population who unfairly controls everything. You know, the difference is minute, but one is inclusive of white people. One is exclusive of white people. Uh, Ramaphosa in his speech tends to be inclusive of those people. He tends to be inclusive of even people that he disagrees with, which makes it very difficult to... In future, if you're an ANC person intending to vote for Ramaphosa, if you, like diverting criticism in the future, this becomes more difficult for you to do. Um, oh, there's a fourth thing that I have to mention as well. Um, the fourth thing is that if Ramaphosa wins, right, the one thing that cannot be denied is that right now, Ramaphosa's messaging seems to resonate with the nation more so than in Kwasada Najlamini's uh, messaging. Her messaging on radical economic transformation, I mean, sounds nice, I guess, but there's basically been nothing from her about what specific policy might look like. It's all been rhetorical in a way. Um, and that rhetoric is not something, it's the rhetoric that we've been hearing from the president and his allies, and it's not something that people 
are necessarily engaged with right now, except for ANC loyalists or ANC Zuma loyalists, sorry. Whereas his messaging about renewal, about stamping out corruption, about reinstituting the rule of law, all of these are messages that people feel we need, you know, because the economy is shit right now, crime is rampant right now, and there's impunity from our public officials regarding their their wrongdoing. So his messaging resonating in that way makes it more likely that the ANC wins in 2019 properly, conclusively, without the requirement of forming coalition governments. If they just win flat out, uh, that's a great position to be in, you know, because then you get to continue your power, not necessarily at the same level as prior, but, you know, you'd rather take, if you ask somebody, would you rather be in charge like would you rather take would you rather still be in charge in a limited capacity or would you rather have would you rather be forced to share all your power because you don't have individual authority i think it's pretty clear what the option is and ramaphosa's messaging seems to lead more likely to the latter conclusion meaning the anc wins in 2019 and that they get to keep they get to keep power you know the status quo will change but it's better to have the status quo change if you're the one directing where it goes. You know, the worst thing in the world is to be in a situation where change is applied to you and you have zero say in the matter, which is what potentially could happen should Nkosazana win, given that the ANC could just be booted from power writ large, um, which is problematic for the ruling party. And another thing which goes into the vote for either of these candidates is a question of that both have mentioned about the soul of the party about how a lot of this is about the soul of the ANC I mean obviously about the soul of the country as well but has a lot to do with the soul of the ANC because right now it's being decided do do we stay our course or do we start anew and I think ultimately that's what the vote is going to have to come down to when you're sitting in that booth as a delegate ready to cast your vote on the slate for leader of the ANC. The question you're asking yourself is, what do I want? Do I want more of the same or do I want something completely different that I'm not sure what it will look like? I'm not even sure if it's necessarily better, if it's going to be better. I'm just, I just don't want this. I don't want the current status quo. Uh, that's going to be the question at the end of the day. And if I'm reading the mood correctly, this is what I think will happen, right? Um, I, I've, I've laid out this entire thing all to get to the conclusion, what I think will happen this weekend, December 16th to December 20th, at the ANC elective conference. If things go smoothly, as in there are minimal disruptions, I doubt there'll be none, but if there are minimal disruptions, if there are no spoiled ballots, like large spoiled ballots, if there's no cheating that seems to be operative, no bribery that's going on at a mass scale behind the scenes. If this is a fair fight, I think Cyril Ramaphosa is going to emerge from this as ANC president, which means he'll emerge from this. Um, ANC probably emerges from this as the ruling party again in 2019, which makes him the national president in 2019, if it all goes smoothly. Um, oh, also one small asterisk that's also contingent on him following through on a couple of things next year. I think probably going to have to recall the president. I think that has to happen in, I think no matter what, no matter who wins, if the ANC f refuses to recall Zuma in 2018, I think there's a 0% chance that they win in 2019. Um, there's a higher chance of Cyril Ramaphosa recalling the president than Kwasazana Tlamini Zuma. But regardless, if he himself also fails to do so, then there's no chance that the ANC wins in 2019. Um, but if he wins, high chance of him recalling Zuma, which means high chance of the ANC winning in 2019. However, if things are delayed, if things are disruptive, if there is straight up and down dirty tactics, if there is bribery, if there is spoiled ballots, if there are officials who are being bribed to miscount or to depose of particular votes and particular ballots, then in Kosovo, Lamini Zuma wins. I don't think she wins a fair fight, but I think it's... It's a fight that's close enough that if you employ the necessary dirty tactics, you can still come out ahead if you're her. But I think the scale of the scale of cheating that will be required for her to win, I don't think she'll it'll be I don't think it'll be possible for her to cheat quietly. 
for her and, the, and her camp to cheat quietly. So if they cheat, it'll be visible. And if it's visible cheating, then it's 0% chance of ANC actually winning. Well, not zero. Nothing is zero in South Africa. But extremely low chance of them winning in 2019. Moreover, if she wins, she's not going to recall Jacob Zuma. Or it's very unlikely she recalls Jacob Zuma in 2018, which also vastly limits the potential for the ANC to win in 2019. So, yeah, having led us all down this shape of what I think about ANC politics as they stand right now, I think Cyril Ramaphosa wins. I think come a week from now, next week, Wednesday, we are going to be hearing that we have a new ANC president. Um, it's still going to be a man. Sadly, we're not going to have the first female ANC president. Um, still will be a, a male president, but also will mean a new male president for the country. I think there's like there's no way that in 2019 we have a female president, no matter what happens um, from any party, really. But if the ANC does deign right now that this is the woman they're going to stake their livelihood on, she will not win in 2019. But I don't think she wins a fair fight right now anyway, um, given all the relevant facts at, at hand. Also, she's not really a great candidate. Like, she's really not that charismatic. She doesn't have anything to say about gender-based violence, for example. She has offered no real words of support during, or no, nothing really substantive during the mass, like major upheavals we've had in recent times in the country. Has not really spoken about corruption, has not really made any big um, engagements about gender-based violence, hasn't really gone to task on our legal in agencies for not prosecuting people, and hasn't really made a broad discussion about state capture. I mean, she's mentioned state capture, but only only with it through the lens, and the, or rather only through the prism of it being attached to white monopoly capital, which, as I was saying earlier, is not messaging that resonates very well right now. So I think her own initial unpopularity, um, or just her, the menace about her, is going to make her lose by her own merits. And then we have Sir Ramaphosa be national president in 2019. But... If you play dirty enough and, you know, your ex-husband needs you to win, and this is the man that has perfected the art of playing dirty in politics, then there's still a chance for you, and it can still come back. And in Kosa Zanat, like Minizuma, could still become the new ANC president, but then deeply diminishes the prospects of the ANC winning in 2019. So, yeah, that's my thoughts on what's going to happen this weekend. Probably next week, I'll get back to more interesting topics than politics uh, well politics i think is deeply interesting and deeply engaging but it's also deeply speculative which can make it difficult to really engage in seriously but nevertheless ladies and gentlemen thanks for joining me i'm sne sean Baslamfu. for the week i think i'm only going to be back um i think this episode the next episode might be delayed by two weeks instead of the usual week downtime but we'll see we'll come back and yeah, that's going to be me for today on the ANC and the elective conference. Uh, let's see if CR17 wins. Hopefully he wins and then recalls Zuma. But Nkwasazana could win as well and basically implode the ANC. Oh, also one more thing. There is a large possibility of the ANC fracturing after this particular elective conference. Whether we see some some um, numbers of people flocking towards the new party headed up by Makosi Koza, um, in the case of an NDZ win, or we just see mass expulsions from the party um, if a CR17 wins. Either way, I think we will see a diminished ANC going to the polls in 2019, not nearly as strong as they are now. I think the movement as it existed is dead and gone for all time. And now if Ramaphosa wins and decides upon renewal, as he says, then the renewed ANC is going to be a completely different animal. Something that we've never seen before, something that we don't necessarily know how to deal with. But, and then if Nkwasazana wins, then it's likely people in Ramaphosa's camp will simply leave the ANC, making it a one-trick pony of corruption, nepotism, looting, and salacious scandals. Either way, the ANC, as we know it, is dead. But let's see what comes up in its place next week. Thank you for taking the time to listen today. If you enjoyed what you heard, you can like us on YouTube, share on your favorite social media, 
and most importantly give us feedback tell us what you liked tell us what you didn't like and tell us what you'd like to hear in future but above all give yourself a pat on the back and continue to have interesting conversations (laughs) 